If you happened to find yourself standing next to an active rocket engine, you would die. Immediately. But, if you could somehow manage it and walk right up to a rocket engine while it was firing and you touched the nozzle, you might find it cold to the touch. Really cold. Most main rocket engines burn fuel and oxidizer to produce thrust. There are a wide variety of fuel types, but a common pairing is hydrogen and oxygen. Both gases are usually cooled until they condense into an extremely cold liquid. These are mixed together in the rocket's combustion chamber where they burn and the products are ejected from the nozzle, generating huge amounts of thrust and heat. So much heat, in fact, that you could boil iron in the centre of the combustion chamber. So how does the rocket's nozzle stay intact despite the punishment of that much heat? There are a few methods of defending against such an intense onslaught of heat, and they pretty much all rely on transferring that heat away, so that the nozzle itself never gets hot enough to become damaged. Some rocket engines are passively cooled, radiating heat away into the surrounding air, or the vacuum of space. You can see this heat radiation as an orange glow. This is a very simple solution, but it does have some drawbacks, as there is an upper limit to the amount of heat an engine can passively shed. If your rocket engine needs to be able to handle more heat, another method of cooling is ablative cooling. Ablative cooling relies on a sacrificial layer of material that is placed on the inside walls of the nozzle. The intense heat chars and burns the surface of the sacrificial layer, but this charred layer acts as an exceedingly efficient thermal insulator, limiting heat transfer to the rest of the spacecraft. As this layer burns away, the bulk of the heat absorbed by the ablative material is carried away by the gases produced by its own combustion. These gases have the added benefit of forming a boundary layer, further reducing heat absorption. Similar technologies have been used to shield spacecraft from the intense heat of re-entering the atmosphere, protecting the crews within. Ablative shielding is effective, but it too has its limitations. It's not a sustainable cooling method, as once the layer of ablative material has burned away, it is gone and so are its cooling effects. This limits the ability for reusing components, which is becoming more and more important in the modern space industry. None of the previous methods actually make the rocket nozzle cold, just less hot. The method that NASA's Space Shuttle and upcoming Space Launch System uses actually makes the nozzle cold. It's called regenerative cooling. At the start of the video, I mentioned how cryogenic propellants are popular in liquid-fueled rocket engines. This means that the rocket has on hand some very cold liquids. Hydrogen, for instance, is only liquid below minus 252 degrees C. This presents an opportunity. Before the liquid hydrogen is injected into the engine, it can be circulated through cooling channels within the walls of the rocket nozzle. Here it vaporizes as it absorbs heat before being fed into the combustion chamber, carrying that heat with it. This keeps the interior of the nozzle below the temperature where it would start to lose structural integrity and, as a byproduct, makes the outside of the nozzle cool enough for ice to form. Ice on the outside of an active rocket engine. Amazing. Regenerative cooling is complicated. Extremely complicated. The engines that powered the shuttle and will power the SLS use a rocket nozzle made up of 1,080 metal tubes, all carefully welded together but that complexity comes with some serious benefits. Regenerative cooling has an incredible capacity for heat dispersal and can be active for as long as there is fuel flowing. There are, however, risks associated with having unburnt fuel in such close proximity to rocket exhaust. Damage to the nozzle can quickly render its cooling insufficient and result in loss of the engine and possibly even the whole craft. This very nearly happened to the Space Shuttle Columbia in 1999. To allow for efficient combustion, hydrogen and oxygen must be injected into the combustion chamber in a very precise manner. To achieve this, the shuttle engine had over 500 individual injectors just for the oxygen alone. 
On occasion, one of these injectors would become damaged, but the engine can function with a few of these injectors out of action. To disable one of these injectors, a gold plug is forced into it, stopping the flow of oxygen. But on the launch of the shuttle in July of 1999, one of these gold plugs became dislodged and was fired out of the engine. As the plug was ejected from the engine, it tore into the wall of the rocket nozzle, rupturing some of the tubes carrying liquid hydrogen. Hydrogen began to leak into the rocket exhaust, which you can actually see in the footage of the launch. You would imagine that extra fuel in the rocket would cause severe problems, but it wasn't as big a disaster as you might think. The real threat from the damage was the reduction of cooling around the damaged area. NASA had considered the possibility of damage occurring to the cooling pipes of the nozzle, and deemed that if five loops of the pipe were damaged, the nozzle would burn through, resulting in the loss of the engine and the likely loss of the entire spacecraft. The damage sustained to the shuttle's engine in this incident was to three of the pipe loops, so the nozzle didn't burn through. Don't forget to subscribe. If you want to support my work and get a whole heap of extra content, you might consider supporting me on Patreon. You can find me at patreon.com forward slash the media ward. You might also like my podcast. You can find links to it down below or just search for the media ward podcast.